is week two of the City Business Festival 2021. My name is Vivian Kai Loco. Welcome to today's edition. Our forum today is going to be for you watching me because I know you are a business owner. A lot of issues around the business terrain. Today, we have two hours to address all issues from credit to taxes to regulators and all that you want to know. This show is for you because I know you have many questions you want us to address to our panel. Feel free to send us those questions in a bit. I'll give you the numbers that you can send our questions to. Our social media handles are also very active. Facebook and Twitter, just send your message. Remember to add the hashtag, the City Business Festival, so we can get your questions to our panel. The numbers are currently on our screen. You can take them now and the hashtag as well is currently on our screen. So you can start sending us those questions. But this festival for this year is sponsored by APSA. It's also co-sponsored by the GIPC. We have support from IT Consultum, also City FM, City TV, and your most comprehensive business news website, that is citybusinessnews.com. Go on to that website. You get stories in making the world of business. So let me tell you a bit about APSA, who are our main sponsors for this year. Now, we know that life is go, 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 and that is hard to make time for the things that really count. So we won't let banking get in your way. Now, that's why with APSA Digital Channels, you can bank when, where, and how you want, so you can focus on what or who is important to you. Banking has never been easier. Transfer funds into your savings account you can pay your old school union dues and your dstv subscription and many more with a click on your phone now get things done simply with the abscess digital channels now that's africanacity that's absa Remember, terms and conditions apply. You can log to their website, absa.com.gh, for further details. Now, for IT Consortium, if you've ever interacted with a financial institution's product, applied for a university online, you've paid your bills online, or with mobile money, there's a great chance IT Consortium's platform has powered the movement of your funds. Now, it's been two decades of pushing the limits of technology to create software solutions and systems that truly make people's lives better. Solutions that give their customers their competitive advantage. We have solutions in banking, insurance, pensions, international remittance, bill payments, and many more. Talk to IT Consortium about the innovations you are dreaming of. We will help you dream and then bring those dreams to life. We are your mobile financial solutions partner. Now, our email is info at itconsortiumgh or dot com or call 0543-884-344 or 0543-884-425. Now, we have a packed panel today, um, and all of them are very, very important to today's discussions. When I come back, I'll introduce our panel. Don't go away. Stay with us.
believe in helping people find a way to get things done. We call this Africanacity. Welcome back to the City Business Festival. This week we're looking at businesses and today our forum is centering around doing business in Ghana. We're looking at micro, small as well as medium scale enterprises. Now our guests for today to help us deal with your questions, the issues around doing business today, I'm going to introduce first those who are here with me in the studio and I have some other guests who are with me via zoom and then our guest um, via zoom, zoom welcome as well to the business festival now we have grace enim yebua she is director of business banking at absa our sponsors grace welcome thank you vivian it's a pleasure to be here good to have you we also have dr abdallah ali nachia he's a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana Law School. Doc, welcome. Thank you very right. much. And then joining us via Zoom, we have um, Madame Jumaima Awari. She's the Registrar General of Ghana. If she can see and hear me, hello, Jumaima. Hello, Vivian. Right. And then we also have Professor Alex Dodu, CEO of the Ghana Standards Authority, who is also via Zoom. Welcome, Prof. Thank you, Vivian. And then, of course, we have our participants who have joined us via Zoom. Welcome all of you, if you can hear me. Later, we'll be joined by the CEO of the GIPC, Yofi Grant, as well. So let's start our conversation. What I'm going to do, guys, is to uh, segment this conversation into two. We'll start with the taxes and the credit. And if Yofi joins us, also look at the environment competition, among others. And then we'll bring in the regulators uh, later as we go along. Uh, that's uh, Madame Chimaima Wari as well as Prof. So if you permit me, I'm going to start with um, the tax bit and then bring in um, Grace as we go along. Because a lot of people start businesses and uh, they are clueless about the, the tax regime. What's, and I was watching a program the other time. The lady was saying it's different to apply the tax and the tax itself on its own. So that's very interesting. So that is there. And then when you come to credit, every business needs credit to run. And um, if you look at our banking regime and access to credit is a long discussion altogether. And whether we even have enough credit and even the cost of credit, among others. So the two of you are very key for the businesses. And um, we'll start with you, um, um, Ali. So the tax regime we have in general, what, what, if you can run us through the general tax regime, then we'll look at the categories of business we have and see what is available to them, how they can take advantage of what and what the law says for all of them. Thank you very much. When we talk about Ghana's tax regime, we are looking at the overall setup of the institution that is responsible for collecting taxes. First, they impose, mm -hmm. collect, and if a taxpayer is not complying, then they enforce. So we have the Ghana Revenue Authority, which has the mandate to impose taxes and collect taxes. The imposition will be by Parliament mm -hmm. under Article 174 one of the Constitution. They have the power to impose taxes. And so when the laws are passed, then it's up to the Ghana Revenue Authority to assess people to the taxes that have been imposed and collect them. So the policy behind the tax making is under the tax policy unit of the Ministry of Finance. Mm -hmm. And so now when the policy comes out, then the law is made in Parliament, then the administrator becomes the Ghana Revenue Authority. Now when we go to the Ghana Revenue Authority, we have the, uh, the direct tax division, okay. that's the domestic tax revenue division, okay. DTRD. They handle direct taxes and domestic taxes in okay. terms of... So if you say that direct taxes and mm -hmm. domestic taxes, yes. what do you mean? You know, we have two major types of taxes, direct and indirect. Mm -hmm. Direct taxes are on incomes. Okay. So employee income, the corporate taxes, mm -hmm. investment income, mm -hmm. 
gifts that we receive are also mm -hmm. incomes that are mm -hmm. taxable <laughs> and then the, so once that are and then capital gains okay. when you realize an asset you have to pay tax then the indirect taxes are on goods and services okay. so we are looking at value added tax VAT we are looking at the COVID levy mm -hmm. of 1% we are looking at the Ghana uh, Get fund, Ghana Education Trust Fund levy. We are looking at the National Health Insurance sure, levy. Yeah. So those are indirect taxes. And also, if you import goods, mm -hmm. then you have to deal with the customs division. Okay. That is at the ports of entry. Okay. That would assess the value of taxes on the goods. And then you would have to pay. Mm -hmm. So we have the customs division. We have the domestic tax revenue division. Okay. And then we have the support services division. Okay. They give support in terms of logistics, audit, risk and all to the the two operating okay. arms as we call them and so that is what we have in terms of structure okay. then in terms of the types of uh, taxes who we've mentioned some of them the value added tax the get fund levy the national health insurance levy and the COVID levy which okay. came recently and then if you get to look at withholding taxes mm -hmm. where a person is earning income has done work for you or supplied goods to you or offered services when you are paying such a person the law requires that you withhold tax okay. and pay over to the revenue okay. it's a payment in advance of the supplier's tax liability okay. so if it is a supply of goods the withholding tax rate is three percent if it is works it's five percent and if it's services is seven and a half percent so those are the range of taxes that are applicable okay. and when it comes to corporate tax we look at the activity that you are engaged in so all businesses are captured to pay 25 percent but if you are in mining and petroleum is 35 percent if you are in the hotel industry is 22 percent okay. so since so. you started doing the brackets already i think we should stay there but let's That's now right. um, go to the categories and start with a small business mm. a, a micro business okay. a lot of micro businesses in ghana yeah. if i go walk on the street right now from, from the lady all the way to the king k and all right. those those are micro sure. you know business but before you answer that uh, yofi grant has joined us uh, ceo of gipc also joining our conversation. Yofi, welcome. Thank you. All right. So, um, Ali, so the lady, the, the lady who sells the kinky, the lady who sells the uh, um, uh, Indomin and all those, those are in the micro. What form of taxes are they expected to pay? With those who are operating in that sector, we have what we call the those who pay by way of tax stamp. Okay. Those who operate in kiosks mm -hmm. and small shops. They pay on quarterly basis depending on the size of their operations. And so if you take the budget that was read and mm -hmm. the laws that were passed after that, because of COVID, there is even an incentive for them okay. that from the second, third, and fourth quarter, they are not to pay any tax. Okay. They have been given so an exemption. So all businesses that fall in the micro... In the micro sector, okay. they pay by tax on hairdressers, beauticians, tailors, Carpenters, okay. they fall in that category. Okay. And then we also have those who are operating transport mm -hmm. by way of taxis, the trotters, mm -hmm. they are also in that category. Okay. So they are enjoying that relief okay. from payment of tax for the second, third, and fourth quarter okay. of 2021. Okay. Let's look at small businesses where we see a lot of um, young people in those in the who were in the corporate decided to move into that category for those people what's in there for them in terms of taxes i think in terms this is of the point it starts getting yes interesting. in terms of taxes when you look at the provisions for reliefs and incentives if you are 35 and below mm -hmm. there is an incentive for you if you're into ict or manufacturing okay. you have five years tax holiday you are okay. not liable to pay tax okay. it's helping them to be able to start up and be able to make it and so they have that incentive and then also depending on the sector the activity you engage in if you're in the hospitality sector for example under the budget and the law that came they have been given 30 percent rebate of their taxes mm -hmm. and the hospitality sector they are already 22 okay. percent so 30 percent rebate shows that you have a lower tax again and if you are engaged in agro processing for mm -hmm. example 
you have within the first five years before commercial production, you are paying a concessionary tax rate of 1%. Okay. And if you are into waste processing, you have seven years to be paying only the 1%. Mm -hmm. And if you are into agri, it depends on whether you are into tree crops, then you would have for the first 10 years, 1%. Mm. If you are into cash crop, maize and sorghum rice, then you have five years to be paying only 1%. Okay. So the sector you are engaged in the sector. comes with the incentives. But, but we have a lot of conversations where people are saying we are paying too much taxes and all that. But with what you are saying, it appears there are a lot of incentives yes. all over. So depending on the, the sector, sector you which sectors in. from what you've studied do not get these incentives at all? They are actually the ones when who are When you want to commerce. Comments. When it's buying, buying and, and selling, selling, you don't have any specific incentive. But that's interesting. Buying and selling yes. is actually ruling our economy. <laughs> Yet, it's not attracting any incentives. But let yeah. me bring in uh, Grace uh, um, now, and then I'll come back to you no on the problem. buying and selling and all that. But Grace, credit is a big challenge for, you know, businesses. And the cost of credit is also very, very high. From where you sit, we know that a lot of components go into calculation of the cost of credit and then um, there are reasons why access to credit is a challenge here in Ghana if you can make us understand w what what the issues are for businesses to struggle to get access to these credit that the banks claim are available <laughs> thank you Vivian and um, good morning once again and thank you for your question I mean credit is available and yet somehow not so accessible um, to a lot of micro, medium, and small-scale enterprises. Um, if you look at the whole lending framework, first of all, what are banks required to do? They take deposits, they give loans. They're intermediaries, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have a scenario in our country where a lot of the deposits bank takes are actually short-term funds. You match that to the loans that customers require, which mm -hmm. can be long-term or short-term, mm -hmm. yeah. depending on the need. The two factors, two maybe key factors that I can talk about that influence the cost of credit. One of them is the perceived risk mm -hmm. of the borrower. So for anybody who approaches a bank to obtain credit, there's a whole risk assessment that is done. In simple terms, we're looking at whether you are able back. to deliver on what you have committed to do and eventually pay back on the funding that you take. The second I've alluded to, which is the paying back, mm -hmm. you know, process. Those two things go a long way. In addition to all the other macroeconomic indicators that operate mm -hmm. in the economy, those two things go a long way to determine the cost of credit. I mean, in recent times, we've seen a very clear downward trend in the cost of borrowing, I remember the days when it was around 40%. 40, yeah, when I started so doing so business, fair, it was 45%. You know, that that feels so. like a lifetime ago. <laughs> and um, thankfully, due to various policy mm -hmm. interventions and a certain deliberate approach by various stakeholders, primarily the government as well, we've seen interest rates trend down significantly. Um, but are they where one would ideally want them to be? 25% on the at average, stage, that's, that's very high. high. What's your profit margin on any business yes. that you're doing? <laughs> You know, but that high cost of funding, you know, is a function, like I mentioned earlier, of the perceived risk. And fortunately or unfortunately, the MSMEs operate in an area where the risk is actually quite high. Yeah. So that, you know, plays a role um, in the cost of funding. Beyond that as well is the cultural tendency, which I believe as a nation we need to work on. And I recall that the governor of the central bank mentioned it recently, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the tendency not to repay, to repay you know, yeah. because that then creates a problem for everybody in the chain or in the mm -hmm. ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, but having said that, however, credit is indeed available. And for the MSMEs, to be honest, the asks are usually not so significantly high that you would say banks in Ghana cannot support mm -hmm. the ask. You know, um, funding is available beyond the need for credit. And to every SME you talk to, they'll tell you, I don't have access to credit. That's my biggest problem. Yes. But one of the things that we have found, because we've been intentional about bringing possibilities to life and the things we need to do, and you'll find that there's also a capacity gap. Mm -hmm. You know, how are we thinking of growing our businesses? Okay. Growing our businesses even beyond ourselves as entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. 
what's the plan? What's the strategy we are working towards? To what extent are we able to open our businesses up to other participants? Mm -hmm. You know, so that the, the founder or owner is not the alpha and omega okay. of the business, but the business is resilient, has the right structures, mm -hmm. and can run, you know, as a legal entity. So all those things come into play to make um, the organization of the SME more attractive mm -hmm. when it comes to lending or credit decisions. And so beyond the provision of finances, also the intentional effort to build the capacity of our yeah. SMEs actually make them ready mm -hmm. to be able to consume the funding mm -hmm. and deliver on the growth. We have one measure of success, it's growth. Mm -hmm. So when you're taking funding, it's so that you can see that your business is growing, you're scaling up, your capacity to do more is increasing. Here we are with Africa in a suddenly larger market yeah. than we've ever had before. How ready are we to participate in that? You've got to have certain structures in place that can help you consume the funding and therefore you know, grow or expand okay. your capacity. How, how do we lead businesses to this point where they look attractive for the banks to lend to them? How do we lead them? Because um, I'm thinking, if I'm going for a loan today for my small business, you would ask me for a lot of things, and that would put me off. You would demand I do certain things, and that would be a put off. Maybe genuinely I want to do them, but the circumstances, the environment makes it difficult for me to do that, to, to be able to get that loan, to uh, you know, grow my business. So how do we lead, and what are some of the things that you should be looking towards to to look attractive to you to come. Your fee was telling me that yesterday that, you know, but, uh, businesses should stop saying that you can't get loans. You look attractive, look good, and let the banks chase you. So what can we do to let the banks now chase us as businesses? Because <laughs> we want to be chased. <laughs> Thank you very much. Banking and the customer is like a marriage, right? And yes. the customer is the woman. And the bank is the guy has to chase the customer. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, and there's a lot we can do to help or support MSMEs to get to that stage. And I'll take it from various angles and I'll share what we're doing as well. Um, so if I take a startup, for example, you're now starting out, you have an idea, concept, whether it's based on technology or production or whatever it is, agri business. Um, how do you even get the help that you need to be able to build your business, build your customer base, and prove that your concept works? So we've created a startup solution, purely startup banking services, where we provide mentoring for experts in that field that you're operating in to support you in the journey. People who have gone through that and been successful to support you know, startups in that journey. Beyond that as well, you've got SMEs, maybe they've operated for many years, but don't have even any corporate governance structures in place. So what we've done, uh, we've done that on our own through our SME clinics mm -hmm. of trying to build the capacity of SMEs. But beyond that, we've taken it a step further in a collaboration with the MasterCard Foundation, where we are providing capacity building to 5,000 MSMEs over the next five years. And anybody can be part of our have anybody. to bank with us. Well, of course, you've got to bank okay. with me. I mean, what's the point? <laughs> I'm giving you value. But actually, our SME clients, for example, are open to everybody. Okay. You don't have to have been a client of ours before you join. But even with the MasterCard Foundation collaboration as well, we are putting intentional capacity building programs in place, okay. working with various um, specialists and business service development um, organizations to actually intentionally do diagnostics of the business and help you get things right and prepare you to be able to access and consume the credit. Okay. Having said that as mm. well, we are mindful that there is a need today. Yeah. This is a journey, right? But today there's a need. So we've got what we call our unsecured or collateral free credit facility where we give up to half a million Ghana cities. Okay. We do not take collateral. We do not take financials. Hmm. We understand that there's a certain base of MSMEs who genuinely want to succeed and have a need to be supported to grow. Okay. Of course, we don't just wake up in the morning, you walk in and we give it and to you. It. No, we built a relationship with okay. you and based on our assessment, and our view of your readiness, we actually provide that funding. Okay. And we have well over 500 of such okay. entities we support okay. with various We'll amounts. come back to that. It sounds interesting. It sounds like something I can take advantage of. <laughs> of course, we'll build a relationship first. But let me bring in uh, Yofi because we'll have to take a quick break and mm -hmm. introduce him formally to our guests. Yofi, welcome again. Thank you.
it's been a tough year for businesses from the small micro whatever we we were dealing with a financial uh, banking sector crisis and COVID hit us in our face and it's the environment has been something else i mean your outfit one of the things you're doing attracting the foreign direct investments also ensuring that within here when they come in they meet the right partners and all that but what kind of environment has been created for Let's stick with the local businesses now, those that you want them to attract, the big shots, and those that are here for them to also thrive from your side. Uh, uh, from our side, uh, we had a plan uh, from long, um, when I joined GIPC, um, to engage. Um, I, I thought that the best way to do it was to engage. And so for, for us, most of the time that we went out, we took with us um, some of our private uh, small businesses so that they meet, they understand first of all the circumstance of investment. And then they meet the investors and then are able to do their own deals and then they come back home and they grow from there. Um, so that was one of it. But um, the, the broader environment, I must admit, has been difficult for everybody. Um, I mean, I'm not sure there's any country in the world that did not actually suf uh, suffer the ravages of the pandemic and, and many of them are still in recovery and as you pro you know uh, many countries have had to borrow huge um, even the, the more stable robust economies are, are borrowing the trillions of dollars to sustain lives and livelihoods and we were not spared either uh, some of the projections that we had prior to covid were totally disrupted and but I dare say that in 2019, prior to COVID, mm -hmm. Ghana's economy was on a great track uh, with a projected uh, growth of 6.8%, um, which was uh, commendable, one of the fastest growing in the world. And then COVID hit. Yeah. And then suddenly changed. everything changed. I mean, uh, and uh, we had to bend over backwards to Change borrow. Your targeting for growth Absolutely. And all Everybody, first of all, lives and livelihoods had to be maintained. So government had to bend itself backwards to find money that it didn't have to ensure that life continued mm -hmm. and livelihoods were, were kept. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I dare say that the, the impact on our economy um, was mitigated somewhat compared to the bigger, larger economies okay. where they are still really struggling. So at the end of the day, whilst most com countries, big countries, went into recession and had negative growth, I mean, Ghana's, Ghana was still positive growth, despite the fact that it was just 0.4%. Mm -hmm. um, but that was a big growth in the world today, uh, that you achieve some positive growth. Um, and that showed some robustness within our economy. And I think that was achieved um, because of the preparedness that we had in dealing with the pandemic, first of all. And then secondly, the fact that we had laid a foundation for a probably more stronger um, economy um, mm -hmm. going forward. But mm -hmm. yeah, but once you had global supply chains, global value chains, global businesses and global economies disrupted, the chances that you'd survive as a country were very slim. And indeed, Ankta had predicted that um, foreign direct investment flows would shrink by some 42%. Well, what's the story for us in terms of foreign direct investment? Interestingly, though, interestingly, uh, for us, the, the situation was a bit different. Mm. And, and I think that was a testimony of the confidence that many investors saw in Ghana and realized that Ghana was doing something right, even in the times of the pandemic. So whilst in 2019, our total foreign direct investment that came into Ghana was $1.01 .01 billion. At the end of 2020, we registered $2.65 billion. Interesting. And what, is it just the confidence or there's something else pulling people? No, it, look, the investor rides on confidence. Um, he, he puts a matrix of factors there and actually takes and decides that, well, yeah, this is a place I can do business. This is a place where my business can grow. Mm. So there's a, um, there is a combination of a matrix of the market, okay. a matrix of policies that you have, a matrix of what plans the country has for the future, and uh, a matrix of w what the incentives are, which, but that's not even very important, but whether there's a market and whether I can survive the market. But the, the prime... The prime um, criterion that most businesses or most investors look for is uh, stability, political okay. and st political stability, and somewhat predictability going forward. Okay. And and I dare say that Ghana sort of demonstrated a bit of that. Um, and and the the mere fact that 
we had a positive growth at the end of the year is testimony to that. 0.1%. 0.4%. 0.4%. We'll come back to that. When we come back, we'll look at the policies, the incentives, all that for the local businesses right. to take advantage. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversations on doing business in Ghana. We're looking at micro, small, as well as medium businesses. Remember, we also have Professor Dodu via Zoom and Madam Jemima Wari um, also via Zoom. That's um, the um, Registrar General as well as the um, director for the Ghana Standards Authority. Here with me, I have Ali Nachia. He's going to answer your tax questions. Um, I also have um, Madame Grace, who's also going to look at your credit issues and your fee grant, looking at the environment for you to thrive. My name is Vivian Kai. Look, we'll be right back. Don't go away. At APSA, we believe in helping people find a way to get things done. We call this Africanacity. Lawful wedded wife to having to hold from this day forward. I do. Saying a bit smash, I'm a winyaji. My HD plus, who no feel it feel. My HD plus, me and your papa palma with HD TV. For star 879 hash, for subscribing, not chow when you feel it feel it, say see ya. Welcome back to the City Business Festival a forum for this week and for today for that matter. We are looking at doing business in Ghana, which is a huge discussion every day. One or two business people meet and complain about the challenges, the issues, and COVID hitting us the way forward for all of us. How do you maneuver in these troubling times? Our guests, five of them, tackling all the issues from every angle. We have Yofi Grant, we have um, Grace Enimiabua, as well as Dr. Ali Nachia Vazu. We have Jemima Wari and Professor Dodu. Yofi, you were talking about the environment and the fact that we've seen our growth target dropping, but then we've done well if you compare to others. But I want to pull you back to the discussion that I hear a lot of businesses talk about in terms of the investment, you know, terrain, where we see, you know, Ghana looks very attractive to investors outside. They want to come do business and all that. But your locals are, are struggling. The balance for the two. All clear our minds over how the locals can also speak nicely like the foreign investors speak of us. Well, you know, the, I, I did say that there are quite a number of issues uh, relating to um, investment within our own country. But if you look at um, uh, a, a certain ratio called investment to GDP, uh, and, and, and most countries compare that as to the stock of savings they have that can go into investment, us is pretty low. Us is very low. I think somewhere less than 12%. Okay. Um, and, and so we are not a savings culture. We are a consumption culture. 
Uh, we consume. Um, somebody makes a bit of money, um, instead of saving, he wants to buy something. And you go and buy a car, you get a house, you know, people owning um, 10 houses, but they are not realtors or real estate dealers, but they just acquire these assets. And so w the market itself is, is defined by consumption much more than production. And that is why we import quite a lot of our, of our things, the things we consume. We even import food. And I, I remember I once said that uh, at some point, uh, total food bill for the year was over two billion dollars, uh, whereas uh, you have land sitting down fallow, and you okay. know we could do have done much more. But it's 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 a difficult terrain for the private business pe person. But you must also bear in mind the history of our business culture, okay. because that's very important. And at a certain time, post independence, everything was state driven. Mm -hmm. So we didn't start with a, a business, private sector business mindset and culture. Most people depended on government for the almost everything. Businesses, yeah. You know, and, and so the state built companies mm -hmm. and people ran those companies. And when everybody left university, they were looking for a job in one, mm -hmm. or, one or two of these. And it's only in recent times, very recent times, that we've seen a culture of entrepreneurship and a culture of private business rising. And... and the political terrain uh, throughout the history also didn't help because at a certain point, I mean, business people had to suffer the brunt of mm -hmm. the ordinary person because they were yeah. almost castigated and branded as the ones who were the leeches of society, etc., etc. So that didn't help with building up a culture of entrepreneurship and business. Mm -hmm. But I dare say that over the past 20 years, we've seen business people imagine. I mean, okay. the ones I remember, the ones was a time when we, we had Ghanaian uh, with the potential of becoming conglomerates. The Sians, mm -hmm. uh, Tata, you mm -hmm. know, um, Kous, uh, B. A. Menses. There were names that we all knew. Yeah. Gazes. Uh, they had big companies that were emerging. But they all, you know, sort of floundered under various issues that okay. um, is not the subject of discussion okay. today. Okay. But having seen that, we went through a certain hiatus and then we decided to move away into a more liberal market-driven economy. Mm -hmm. And we've since then started seeing young people um, build new companies. And we've seen uh, private sector companies come up uh, that have grown and become big. Even the finance sector, the banking sector, the commerce center, uh, the sector, and the, the agri sector. Mm -hmm. It's the productive sector that has suffered the most, though. Okay. All right. But I think that the new policies that have come up, and uh, I, I, I know there's not a political platform, but this, for the purpose of planning, mm -hmm. I, I suspect that over the past four years, a certain foundation has been laid that is pushing the country in a certain direction, moving away from the export of raw materials and resources okay. and adding value. Okay. Now, where you just have to dig out your gold, dig out your box, dig out your hand, it doesn't require a lot of, you know, intellectual firepower to do mm -hmm. that. But when you have to work in a factory, you have to work in With value addition, value addition. you know, you create better opportunity for people to learn new things, have stronger knowledge and skills, and therefore a better chance of wealth creation. So now with the, the move to move away from um, just the export of raw materials, materials into value added, there is a great opportunity for the private sector to take the, horn, lead, take the bull by the horns and lead that. Okay. And I think that a policy, and you mentioned policies, mm -hmm. a policy that is a one district, one factory, is an emergent policy that actually is a foundation of industrialization in the economy. Okay. Well, we'll come to your, your, your policies in details, the conversation, the time is just flying. Let me bring in our <laughs> two uh, panel members as well. They've been patient with us, uh, holding on for a while now. Madam Jemima Wari as well as Professor Dodu. Uh, Madam Jemima Wari, if you can hear me, let's look at um, how easy it is to start a business in terms of registration from your side a lot of people years back i remember people used to complain about how challenging it was to you know register a business the pros and cons and it was a big discussion these days we don't hear much of that it appears things have improved and all that but from your side what have you put in place to ensure that it's easy to go through the process thank you very much vivian and uh, the many viewers looking at us uh, the Registrar General's Department since 2016 has been going through a lot of reforms and uh, currently our business processes at least are online for those who want to use that process. 
we have developed forms and put it online for our various customers to download, to complete online. But some still choose to walk into our offices to hand over their documents that they've completed. And even if you come into our office, we have different types of businesses you'd like to register. We can start off with a business name, like one man business. It's very, very easy to register. It just costs 60 Ghana cities. But um, before coming, you must have a business plan. You must have a name. You must have a tax identification number. Now it's been changed to the national identification uh, card number. Mm -hmm. And as I'm talking right now, we have the NIA um, organization stationed in our offices. We have the GRA also stationed in our offices. The president has come out to say that we are going to use only the NIA card. And this was from April 1st. What that means is that we're giving ourselves, before the end of this year, every business will just have the unique identifier of the NIA card. And so just to register a business name, you can do it online. Uh, our website is www.rgd.gov.gh. We can pay online now through the Ghana.gov. You can pay online. You can use Visa. You can use Momo. You can use MasterCard. It's very easy. You don't need to come into our offices to register. The best news for me to also tell my various clients is you can also renew your business online. And it is just star 222 hash. Once you go through that process, you can renew online. And so that, uh, you know, when people come and queue for hours on end in our office, just renew a business, we have digitized that. That is what business means. You can register a partnership, which is two to 20 people. And that's something that most people don't know. They only think of companies. Companies are very, very, very strict and rigorous now. There is a new act in place that makes it very rigorous for you to have a company. So I would advise when you're starting a business, start with a business name. One man business, you're all alone. You make profits alone, you make losses alone. You don't need to file to have returns and have meetings and all those things. It's very simple. And then you come to partnership. That one has an incorporated, uh, you know, you are incorporated, okay. You live on long after that one partner dies. The fee is just slightly higher than the business name, which is 60 Ghana cities. For partnership, you pay 130 Ghana cities to register a partnership. It's slightly yeah. higher. Yeah, you need a partnership agreement to govern your operations. You just need to stamp it at the a land valuation board. And that's it. You have an agreement governing your operations. You are good to go. You renew it, of course, yearly. But when you come to companies, it's a bit more rigorous. Now, with the New Companies Act, I will say this. Because of issues we've had in the past, the corporate governance issues have been strengthened. So apart from you having a name, you need a minimum of two directors, a minimum of one shareholder. Now, you would also need an auditor to be rotated six yearly. Every six years, you have to change your auditors. Okay. It didn't need to be that, that before. All directors now have to swear to a statutory declaration that they have not been involved in any fraud or caused any company to go into insolvency. And then this is you happened before. So now you have to swear to a declaration. You have to even consent to be a director. In the past, you have anybody being made a secretary. It could even be your maid or your driver <laughs> with absolutely no knowledge about company law. That is not happening anymore. You need some qualification, a professional or tertiary level qualification. And so because this company secretary is going to be the one to direct and guide the directors to conform and you know, make sure that they comply with the provisions of the Companies Act. All these are changes. We've reduced the the age now from 21 to 18. So okay. uh, an 18-year-old person can register a company. And then uh, another good thing is you don't need to swear before a commissioner or both anymore to get a certificate to commence business. As long as you start your, you know, we don't have any, the minimum equity requirements have been, have been taken off almost for all Ghanaian companies. But when we have foreign companies who are going to go through uh, Uncle Yo fees um, uh, GIPC. GIPC, yes, you would need to have minimum equity requirements for 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 shareholders who have a foreign participation. That is a joint venture. 
the foreigner needs to contribute to a minimum of 200,000 US dollars mm -hmm. equivalent in Ghana cities to the company. If it's a wholly owned foreign entity, a minimum of 500,000 US dollars. And if it is trading, whether you have a Ghanaian part participant or not, it's 1 million US dollars. So okay. that's why I'm saying that these are levels. We say micro. Micro starts with a business name. Okay. You know, yeah, start with the business because it's becoming very, very, you know, uh, rigorous in the company arena. And people don't seem to know. So everybody says, I want to register a company. They just want to go and get a visa. And then they'll come and register. <laughs> and then they are sitting on my database and they don't file returns. Then I'm coming out. I'm going to strike you off. Okay. It doesn't look like so, that. That's okay. Right. I want to bring in Professor Dode because he's been so patient with us. But um, I will come back to you in a bit over, you know, some of the issues around the registration. But Prof, you listen to businesses and the last thing most talk about is standardization. It appears that people think, oh, you, you don't need that. I'm already dealing with the taxes. I'm already dealing with the credit. I'm dealing with the environment. I'm dealing with registration, filing my annual returns. I don't need to be bothered about that. Tell us the essence of your um, organization in all the business, in the business arena. Thanks very much, Vivian. I was actually enjoying um, Jemima <laughs> and learning so much from her, but then she had to give me some time to speak as well. So it's true that most businesses do not think about the standards angle at all till they start processing. But if you are doing business, as I heard my friend from Backlist said, you want to expand your business. Every business attracts more customers. You want to sell more, you want to provide more services. You want to reach more people. Now, anybody buying a service, a commodity or a good, is looking for value. And that value normally is defined in terms of a standard. They want a requirement. Okay. If you do not provide that requirement consistently and reproducibly, people will not buy your product any longer. So at the end of the day, standards we see are the language of trade. Whether it's trading goods, trading services, People want to buy an item. They want to define it. And normally, the definition is a standard. And basic as it may sound, if you want to buy a phone, you give the name. I want just name the brand and name the number. And you know that the features will be consistent. They will be reproducible. And whether you buy it in China or Japan or Ghana or anywhere, the same for standards. It just defines what you want to get, okay. and it gives it to you. Why is it important? Trading has become very fast. So you want both the seller and the buyer to have no doubts about what is being offered and what is being purchased. Once that is done, you can move very, very fast. Okay. Secondly, if you look at our small businesses, a lot of people want to produce, let's say, orange juice, mm -hmm. agro-processing. Mm -hmm. We know very well that orange juice can be pure or it can be a mixture. Okay. For someone with diabetes, if he wants to buy pure orange juice, if you add sugar, you change the game. If it's pure orange juice, the requirements are different. You may not be able to freeze it for long because it will spoil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The good news for all our businesses is that the Ghana Standard Authority and I would say all international standards agencies are here to make business work. Why? Companies need to conform to the standards. When they do conform to those standards, they can then connect to any market. As they begin to connect, definitely they will compete, whether okay. locally or internationally. Okay. And, and I must say, I'm happy that we are seeing a lot of knocking on our doors by Ghanaian businesses asking us for the requirements for trading. Okay, so let's look at the various sectors. For example, which um, types of business must necessarily knock at your door to ensure they are in line with the standards? Is, must the standard be for every business? or particular ca uh, categories or sectors must ensure they knock at your door? So this is the interesting thing about standards. Because it's a trading tool, at best, at best, every standard is voluntary. Okay. And that's what's interesting, at best. However, for health and safety and environment reasons, national governments, including our governments, make several standards mandatory. So the standards for food and medicines are mandatory. You okay. cannot, and these are enforced by the various regulatory agencies. 
Now you need standards for everything. But let's take the issue of agro-processing or food or wood or other things. These standards become important usually for the protection of consumers. So at the end of the day, you cannot run away from them. Mm -hmm. If you are producing a home just to supply to a few people, the risks to human health are few, and the re regulatory requirements are also less. By the moment you go into producing for a large number of people, we are duty bound to protect the large number of people by ensuring that what you give to them meets the minimum health, safety, and environment standards. And that is why those things then become mandatory to, for the protection of the public and the protection, I mean, of human life. However, let's take if you are producing soap. Mm -hmm. Apart from ensuring that the caustic levels are not too high, you are not going to worry about microbial contamination, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to an extent. Okay. However, if you're producing anything to be ingested, you know, you have to be extra careful. So that is how we, we play it. It's a risk-based approach. But both the Food and Drugs Authority and the Standards Authority, the two agencies involved mostly in food and related items, have started offering what we call progressive licensing from the FDA or graduated certification. If you're a micro business, four employees producing for a small number of people, the bar has been brought so low that we are looking at just help safety and a decent working process okay. but as you begin to grow then we demand that you have these quote-unquote iso level standards mm. because we want to bring people onto the scale and as they are there they can only get better but how easy is it to meet these iso standards immediately you start mentioning the technical things they start running away because it looks complicated and it looks like it's a long you know trial of all that how easy is it for moving from micro to small to meet those standards they have to meet to be able to become world-class businesses as well maybe actually they are not complicated at all i must say that and I would hold my hand up and say that it's, it's the fault of all of us who speak big English to them. <laughs> because at the end of the day, if we cannot break down the language to what they can understand, someone is producing A and B, you are saying, please write that in the morning, you take the mori out, keep it for 10 minutes, etc., etc. So what we are doing now is sensitizing the public to realize that the processes are very simple. That is number one. Number two, a very good entrepreneur may not necessarily be a good bookkeeper. And it's our job, whether as a standards agency or corporate or other agencies, to give them that help to augment their business. So I tell a businessman, let me explain to you in simple language, but let one of your workers be trained to do the writing. Because a simple businessman doing plantain chips, yes, we have a standard of plantain chips. But all he needs to know is that these are what should be in it, and these are what should not be in it. The English language, or if I'm a way, should even be in tree or any other language or gap, that language itself should not be the barrier. So we, we are changing. And yes, we are also digitizing to ensure that businesses can access these things. Because the moment fulfilling technical requirements become a barrier, we have lost the game. Mm -hmm. The smartest musicians or producers of food, drinks, or anything, or creative arts people, may not have time for this paperwork. However, they need the paperwork for consistency, for reliability, for auditing, and so on and so forth. And it's our job to provide them that infrastructure. And fortunately, I think the country has woken up to that, and we're having this discussion. So let all businesses watching this show or listening be aware of one thing. We are open for business, and what we do is to partner you to know the requirements and to show you how they can be met. You don't have to figure it out. Ask us in simple language and let us explain to you. Okay, so you see a lot of us trooping to your offices from tomorrow to check whether, I mean, what we are supposed to do to ensure that we meet the standards. Fashion industry, are we supposed to come to you? Absolutely. We have, we have standards for all sorts of fabrics, for females and males, for school uniforms. And just to chip in, a lot of our exporters of textiles lose out because a simple thing like what we call care instruction okay. just having that small piece of thing yeah. may have sales this so how you wash, how to wash your cotton what if it's you know, cotton? It. and unfortunately it's mandatory in most markets okay. so please talk to us and i hope city would engage us and them <laughs> so that we help them meet this minute 
it's very, very small. Okay. However, it's a deal breaker in America, in Europe, and in other markets. Okay. I'll come back to you. You, get, you take us through some of the things you've noticed from the various sectors that they have, we are failing to do as businesses, which is, you know, putting the barriers between us and the um, international um, trade arena and all that. But let me come back to you, uh, Madam Jemima Owari. Guys, I'll come back to you a bit. You guys had 30 minutes, so bear with me. <laughs> um, so you've done your registration. You were talking about the fact that it's, very, it's better for businesses to start small, the micros, register one-month business and grow, as, um, and grow along. And then let's say you've done that. What's the next step for, for, for you? And then take us through the small scale and then the medium scale in terms of the annuals. Because sometimes you get the, the messages from your outfit about annual filing. You get another one that says this, another one. And it's all confusing for businesses. But run us through for us to understand how we can do it to ensure that we're doing the right thing and you don't strike us off your register because we're ignorant about some of the rules very much so clearly i've already said that you would need a unique identifier which is the nia or the tin to get yourself registered once you're registered of course you can use that document to go open an account at any bank that you want to open with at the end of each year for a business name you just need to renew the business name and that's 25 ghana cities okay the law is very clear if you don't renew it your business name lapses. By lapses, I mean I should take you off the register. Mm. And many, we've just been, you know, just been very lenient, and I've kept almost all these business names sitting on the register all these years, but that's going to come to an end. From the end of <laughs> July, yes, we'll go through the records. If we realize that you have not renewed a business, it's just 25 Ghana cities, and I've given you the new... Uh, was it the, 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 the code? You can just use star 222 two, two, hash. Two, two, hash. Yes, and renew your business name so that you'll be in good standing on the register. So you finish that bit, then you go to the partnership. It is um, slightly higher to register, to renew that one. That one is 50 Ghana CDs to renew it. And it's the same as a company. To, for the company, you need to file an annual return. And many times people will say that, oh, I have not done any business, mm -hmm. so why should I come and file an yes. annual return? Yes. I think they've got it wrong. When you file an annual return, what you're doing is updating the registrar general okay. of changes okay. that have taken place in your company. So, for instance, if in the life of the camp or the year you have appointed new directors or you moved offices or you've uh, brought on a new shareholder, or you've changed your auditors. That is what I mean that you should, at the end of the year, when you're updating us by the annual return, let us know whether there have been any changes in the car. So whether you've carried on any business or not, it's, it doesn't really matter. And it's just 50 Ghana cities. Because of that, you're going to end up having your name stricken off the register or have a penalty of 450 Ghana cities to pay in addition to each year that you have to file the returns. So I'm just informing everybody, filing the annual return doesn't really matter whether you've done business or not. But it's mandatory that you file a financial statement okay. with the annual return. Okay. That financial statement, if you've not done any business, the auditors will state that this is a nil return. And so you'll attach that nil return to your annual return booklet, which you can also download from our website and update us on any changes that have taken place in the company. This is quite an important information to give out there because since 2011, when we introduced the new e-registrar software, I can tell you I have over 200,000 businesses that have not filed annual returns, mm. nor have they renewed their businesses. Basically wow. because some of them think we have not done any business, things are hard, COVID has come. Fine, COVID came. You know, as a department, we gave extensions for people to file the annual returns. We extended it for close to a whole year. We allowed businesses to hold AGMs virtually because they couldn't meet. We gave all these dispensations. But now the time is up. By the end of June 30th this year, we are going to start another round of penalties. 
Because okay. we got, okay. yes, we gave the dispensation up to the end of December, and we've pushed it to, you know, uh, June thirtieth now, and it looks like people are just resting on their oars. Okay. Businesses are not renewing. They think that there's, you know, no penalty in case. But with business names, of course, there's no penalty. But what is going to happen now is the business name lapses, so it's going to be taken off. Okay. The list of businesses that I have been working with for over a year now, given enough notices that please come and file returns. Mm -hmm. By the end of mm -hmm. July, we will, what we do is we strike the name of the register. Mm -hmm. We will mm -hmm. make it inactive. Mm -hmm. If it's inactive in the system, any time you come back and you want to resurrect it, you have to go back to the courts. Okay. And the courts is at their discretion. Wow. Is that there? So please, these are things I'm putting out. I wouldn't really want to do all that I'm doing. It's a simple thing. Okay. You can download the forms, 50 Ghana cities to file your returns, and, and penalty 25, and for partnership 50. So that is it. It's not that difficult. So I think the message is clear. All businesses file your return. It doesn't matter if you are hit severely by the COVID and you've not done any business. It doesn't mean you're saying that you did any business, but it's just to put on the record what has happened within your business over the period. We'll take a quick break. When we come, we'll take some more comments from all of our guests, the five of them, on their particular areas. And then we'll start taking your questions. So you can start sending them. You can send them via Twitter or Facebook. Remember to add the hashtag, the City Business Festival. Alternatively, you can send it via the phone lines. The number is currently on your screen. We'll be right back. Don't go away. At AXA, we believe in helping people find a way to get things done. We call this Africanacity. Welcome back to our forum today on doing business in Ghana for the small, micro, and medium-sized business. We have a lot of you via Zoom, and I just want to say hello. Thank you for making time to join us. In a bit, we'll take your questions. Let me announce the phone lines, 0550-585-832. That's 0550-585-832. I have um, five... Um, Four gentlemen, no, actually three gentlemen and two ladies who are well vexed in their areas. I have um, Yofi Grant, CEO of GIPC. I have Grace Enim Yabwa, she's Director of Business Banking at APSA. I have Dr. Abdullah Ali Nachia, he's Senior Lecturer, University of Ghana Law School, as well as Jemima Wari, the Registrar General, and Professor Alex Dodu, he's the CEO of the Ghana Standards Authority. So 
anything around the, your business, this is it. This is the time for you to ask all those questions. I'm doing my best to ask some of the things you want to know, but your individual ones, personalized ones, feel free to send us a message now via the number on your um, television screen as well as on Facebook and Twitter. Just add City Business Festival. Let me come back. Now, this round is for all of us, so I'll be hitting you guys in and out. But let me come to you, Yofi. Now, for two, three years now, there's been the back and forth. You remember earlier I was telling you, we, we hear so much nice things for the foreigners, but what about the locals? And it appears uh, when you listen to the locals, they think you, you are helping more of the foreign companies and not doing much to protect local companies. We've, we still have the issue with the Nigerian traders, with Guta. That matter is still running. And others we've seen from other places mm -hmm. and all that. What is the plan to really make the locals know that GIPC is not just for the FDI bit, mm -hmm. but to also ensure that the locals are doing well to, to thrive. Well, I, I think that message is hitting home, and I did mention to you that when we go on our missions, we take our local business people with them. In fact, uh, the, the reality is over the past two years, notwithstanding COVID, we've had a lot more local companies now register with GIPC because they realize that the incentives and whatever assistance we give is, is neutral, it's country neutral. Mm -hmm. And so there are Ghanaians who are getting the same incentives that other foreigners who come into the market are getting. Okay. It's based on the company size. So give us examples, uh, I mean, of some of the incentives Ghanaian companies can also get. For example, if, if you invest more than $50 million, you are considered a strategic investor, mm -hmm. and therefore you can negotiate certain incentives and certain waivers um, for, for your business to make sure it gets to the profit level. Mm -hmm. And then um, if you're in the manufacturing or export trade business, you don't pay duties on your equipment when they get to the port. These... Are, and. And we get the applications every time. So okay. sometimes... Can we check our sound for the <coughs> Registrar General? I'm told um, we ca they cannot hear a UFI grant. If you can check that. Yeah. So sometimes I'm, I'm a bit surprised when uh, local people say we are not helping them because it's most of the local importers who who get the waivers on um, the, the oh, equipment that's that that's coming, yeah. especially if it's for manufacturing and for export trade. Okay. Um, so manufacturing, they, they sorted. Um, those um, bringing in equipment and all that. Right. And those doing business uh, of how much? Uh, 50 million? 50 said? million, the strategic investors. The strategic status. investors, but, okay. But for us at GIPC, I mean, we are a Ghanaian company. Mm -hmm. it, whatever we do must benefit Ghana. Yeah. So whether we are bringing foreign direct investment or we are facilitating indigenous or domestic investment, it must benefit the economy. Mm. So I, I think there's a slight misconception that we are only there to help foreign direct investors. But I must also say that people sometimes didn't understand the impact of foreign direct investment. Mm -hmm. And recently, quite recently, um, I, I was a witness to the 25th anniversary celebration of MTN's business in Ghana. Okay. Now, if you get to know the number of businesses that have been built up on the back of MTN alone, mm -hmm. thousands by Ghanaians. So when foreign capital comes in, what it does is it brings in knowledge, it brings in skills, but mm -hmm. it brings in opportunity. Okay. And more people can get to build their, their, their businesses. But mm -hmm. I also have to say, look, the, the, the lot of the private sector business person is hard. Mm -hmm. It's not just hard in Ghana, it's hard everywhere. Mm -hmm. And as I told uh, Bernard yesterday, uh, global statistics indicate some like for every hundred new businesses that are set up, only 10, only 10 survive. survive. Now, there are Scary. many factors that go into the success of a business. There's governance, there's standards, as Alex says, and if you want to compete in the world and you, your packaging is poor as compared to some great, nice-looking, attractive package, mm -hmm. your business will fail. Mm -hmm. If you don't have governance statutes on your books and that enable you to take certain disciplinary actions against yourself when you're, you're doing something that is not right to the business, yeah. you will fail. Mm -hmm. If you don't do your market study, you don't hire the right people to give you the good advice to take your goods to the market, your business will fail. If every weekend uh, you have to go to a funeral or you have to go to a wedding <laughs> or you have to go to something, you just dip your hand in the kitty of the business and say, well, it's your business, so yeah. um, I can take money out and go and spend it. Your business is likely to fail. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the, the interesting thing about business is that there are some two parts of it. There's the capital part of it and there's the cash part of it. Mm -hmm. But the best business is one that has cash flow. 
cash comes in, cash goes out, cash comes in, cash goes out. And I, I suspect that in today's uh, world, financial world, most banks have moved away from asset bank lending. So the, you take your house as property yeah, and lend you money. Yeah, no. Yeah. They want to know what the business is spitting yeah. out in cash. It was Grace, was, what Grace was saying. That, well, if I put money in there every month, I know that at least my I little bit of payment, I'll get yeah. it back. Because I'm not, the bank is not a property dealer. He yeah. doesn't care about houses. He mm -hmm. cares about his money. That is good. Mm -hmm. But people also forget that the monies that the banks lend out are also investments by other people. Yes. And they want their money back. And you, 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 you know what happened when there was a, a near banking collapse. Yes, yes. It's people's monies that were deposited at the banks that were lent to other businesses mm -hmm. that probably failed. Okay. And so the monies could not go back and the banks themselves failed. Okay. And government had to step in. Okay. You know, so it's, it's, it's not as simple as it is. And uh, uh, simple as people say that, oh, business people say that, oh, they, they, they find it difficult to go and borrow money. The bank needs to be very certain that if I put my one penny in this company, I'm going to, I'm get, going it to get it back. It's okay. like you. You will not give your money to me. No, no, I won't give it to you if I don't trust you. If you don't trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I will not play with my money like but that. I, I but I can say that okay. we're also in a situation okay. where there are many other factors involved. For example, you, you mentioned um, the problem that we have with uh, uh, traders, mm -hmm. where there's a law, there's a clear law yeah. that has been infringed by foreign traders. Mm -hmm. That has to be dealt with. Yeah. But on the bigger business ecosystem, mm -hmm. protection is good, mm -hmm. but incentive is much better. Okay. So if our traders get a very attractive incentive, that makes them competitive. Mm -hmm. They will outcompete any foreigner that comes in. Okay. If they get lower cost of capital, if they pay much less taxes, if they pay at all, and if, if they have access to um, some money at lower cost, like I said, access to lower, uh, cheaper, cheaper capital, capital, they can outcompete anybody who comes to the market. Okay. But they can't outcompete somebody who's borrowing at 1% um, and to buy his goods and come in. He doesn't have to buy Forex yeah. and brings in. They can't Very compete they can't. So, and in their own country. Okay. So the, 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 the issues are being solved. I think uh, we did hear that um, there's a possibility that uh, a special financial institution will be set up yeah, to assist a national uh, assist our traders because bank. trading is part of the distribution chain of every business okay. you, you must have traders to carry your goods and go and sell mm -hmm. and things and now that we are entering the africa free trade area we must be very conscious that the better our market gets the more we are likely to see um, business move up but foreign okay. traders also look at the market because ghana's economy is growing faster um, uh, middle class is growing faster and as I did mention, we are a consumption economy. We will okay. be a target by other foreigners. But so far as the laws are there, yes, some uh, measure of protection is important. But the bigger good is that we incentivize our traders to be able to outcompete anybody who comes into the market. Okay. And I think that is a, is a policy yes. issue that we need to. Okay. I think Ali, you want to say. I want to add to the issue about the GIPC being there for even local investors. Mm -hmm. I have been wondering when we're talking about one district, one factory, whether they knew they could go to register with GIPC mm. and even get more benefits. Yeah. Because one of the benefits of the 1D1F is the exemption from duties on the import of equipment. Okay. And I'm sure the value of the equipment will exceed the minimum $50,000. Right. Yes. But you so, know, Ali, there are all these incentives available. You yes. guys are in there, so yes. you know. I mean, it's not out there. A lot yeah, of these things are why such, new to... such programs you are doing <laughs> is good. Yes. At least yeah. we have veered away from the <laughs> political talk, and we are now talking about Real business. business. Yeah. So that is what yeah. will bring the yeah. jobs, will create the jobs, put mm -hmm. food on the table, let people get to know this and yeah. how they can get it. But, but I can tell you something, that the banks advertise a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, Ministry of Trade and Industry has a website that even has all the laws mm -hmm. that relate to business in Ghana. But very few business people go to check these things. Okay. Um, very few people were coming, very few local businesses were coming to us um, because I, you were tagged like you are just concentrating on the foreign businesses. Yeah, so but that was a tag that that's, was a, a, that's a, a misconception. <laughs> so was, and but also because of the ego of Ghana yeah. right. so what you mentioned. Yes. You can now go online, renew your registration. It's the same that mm -hmm. the GRA is doing. Yes. Mm -hmm. www.gra.gov.gh. Okay. You can download the forms, you can download information, you get access to all 
what you need to know. Okay. And they have areas you can ask questions and get right. answers. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but, but is networking. Okay, let, we have a hang on. <laughs> let me let to, Grace to come correct in. that <laughs> government's policy mm -hmm. is to ensure wealth creation okay. at the local level. Okay. So all the policies you see have been calculated I get towards to, that. to create Well, wealth. I want to test all, so you will see. That's <laughs> <laughs> so, great. One of the things that we need to do, and um, probably consolidate all the information. They are mm -hmm. in bits and mm -hmm. pieces in mm -hmm. various departments yes. and, agencies. you know, authorities and agencies. So um, creating sort of like a collection a of... A one-stop shop for everything. One in Why Ghana, don't we have that? Know, one for you know, um, um, Madam Jemima, um, GSA, yourself, yeah. all together. We yeah. need something. Plus like banking and tax. Yes, I mean, tax. We put it all together. Actually, GIPC, we are on the verge of putting that together. Mm. We are How soon can we see that? Because well, our viewers are watching. Because that they want is to what they actually are. Yes. They mm -hmm. are supposed to be a one-stop shop. shop. Yes. When so, you go, yeah. all your tax issue, registration issues, financial issues, they should sit down and direct you where to go. Where to mm -hmm. go? They will not be able to give you the finance. Mm -hmm. But they can They'll say, let's get, this place get in touch yeah. with the GRA on this issue. This is available to you under the law. Mm -hmm. Check with this bank. They have this facility of uh, yeah. funding for mm -hmm. SMEs. Right. That, that kind of, so that's that's like we have a lot of work Oh, there's do. a lot of work to do. We're going to use artificial to intelligence <laughs> to enable people get the access they want. You have yeah. to give me the timelines because I'll come back to you whether it's a month or two, to find out what you've done. Because if you say it on this program, you have to make of sure course, you deliver. Of course, but we are telling you we'll do it. It's okay. not you asking us to do let, it. Let me say quickly that we have to bring in our Zoom, uh, Zoom viewers right. to ask their questions. There are a lot of questions coming for all of you. Right. And we'll try as much as questions. possible to get them to answer all your questions. So guys, don't worry. Let me start with the questions because time is real. I think the first one is going to you, Ali. This yeah. one says, I have been contracted to provide a service mm -hmm. Comes as an individual over a one year period. Mm -hmm. The amount I earn is subject to a withholding tax mm -hmm. of 7.5%, <laughs> as mentioned by the contracting organization. Mm -hmm. I will also be paying tier 1, 2, and 3 pension for mm -hmm. myself. Okay. I believe these are tax exempt, he's asking you. And then he's also asking Is the withholding tax the only tax obligation I will have to pay, mm -hmm. or others coming? And if yes, which ones? Also, am I required to file my tax annually, quarterly, mm -hmm. or year? Mm -hmm. I have just a few different things and I just want to make sure I'm doing the right thing. Should okay. I go over your call with you? No, I'm okay with it. Okay. You know, when he's invoicing for the job, then there is VAT he has to charge. Mm -hmm. There is get fund that should be on his invoice. There should be national health insurance levy. There should be COVID levy. So what he is talking about is the withholding from the beneficiary of the service that's on the income tax but his invoice should have all these so if he's not registered with the gra he has to register because if you are not registered VAT trader you cannot charge the vat and that will not be all the tax he will pay because at the end of the day he's supposed to file his returns the withholding is a payment on account mm -hmm. at the end of the day his cost has not been taken into account it may well be that at the end of the day he has overpaid mm -hmm. his taxes okay. because the withholding is on the gross invoice. Mm -hmm. So it's good to file his returns, file his account, and then he is likely to maybe fall into a credit, which he will be entitled for a refund. Okay. Yes. Um, Selassie Jekunu, hello. I'm told you've been very um, nice with us this morning and this <laughs> afternoon. She wants to know, to you, Geofi, what are the requirements for a small local service business mm -hmm. to register with GIPC? The requirements for a small local service business to register with you guys? Nothing much. I mean, if it's Ghanaian, um, then you don't have to fulfill some of those minimum capital obligations that are there. Um, all she needs to do is to come to GIPC. She will be met by an officer who will take through the process. There's a very small registration fee you pay just to maintain your account. But otherwise, there isn't much. But I'll tell you something very interesting. Because um, whilst we expect that uh, when you're a foreign business person, you have to fulfill certain minimum capital obligations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, if you're in a joint venture with a Ghanaian, yeah. then you have to demonstrate that you brought in $200,000. And if it's fully foreign owned, you have to bring in or demonstrate that you brought in $500,000. It mm -hmm. may be either goods or equipment or cash. Now, it has impact on your registration at Registrar General. Because mm -hmm. if the foreigner is assumed there is a 50 50 joint venture, 
and the foreigner brings in $200,000. It's presumed that the Ghanaian will also bring $200,000. Yeah. But we don't require the Ghanaian to register that. Okay. But we require the foreign to do that. To do that. So very often there are complaints that, well, yes, but mm. I brought it. And, 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 and the reality is that even in the joint venture, the Ghanaian should have a minimum of 10%. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay. If, if it's uh, 90 Ten percent, and it's a, it's a, a, and the foreigner brings in two hundred thousand, mm -hmm. and the Ghanaian has to bring in um, a proportion that well, represents ten percent of the business. Mm -hmm. So you add this proportion to the two hundred thousand mm -hmm. to give the capital of the business. Okay. So these are some of the things that are there, but the Ghanaian doesn't have to demonstrate that. In fact, per our rules, the Ghanaian may register. He doesn't is not obliged to register. Okay. Although it also says that we have to register all enterprises. Okay. A GIPC. Mm -hmm. Now I, I think that needs to be refined mm -hmm. yes. a bit yeah. more. Yes. Um, because when we go to registrar generals, uh, we want information from uh, from them on some companies registration. They want us to pay. Okay. It's not for free. It's not it's not for free. But I always tell them that this is a state to state. This mm. is but why are you paying for it? Why don't you mind why? You know, you tell us but these why. are issues that we have we to resolve. Have yeah. Yeah. We have to resolve. There's a reason. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us why. Let me, let me answer that problem. That deal with that for you. Calm <laughs> down. <laughs> <laughs> but don't you mind why? Why must they pay? I mean, because the cost of maintaining the software has to be paid for by us. IGF cannot take care of that. It's so anybody who wants that data has to contribute to maintaining that software. Otherwise, that whole software will crash, and nobody will even get data. So whether it's a government institution or not, apart from competent authorities, that is police, IOCO, FIC, SHRAJ, every other institution that wants that data has to contribute to maintaining the data at the data center. We need over six million dollars just for this year. Where am I going to get that money from? So everybody has to contribute. Otherwise, nobody gets the data. You know, initially it was a public-private partnership, and the private partner was maintaining the software with his own funding. And now they've transferred that software to us. And so, as an institution, IGF, I'm just having 13%. Okay. Of IGF, I, 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 you know, bring up. If okay. 13%, I have over five regional offices. I have to maintain them with that same 13%. And the software is a very important aspect of our whole business operations. And okay. if I don't get money to maintain it, nobody will get data. Okay. No data. Yes, that's it. All so, right. Okay. So, okay. Let me take. Uh, okay, thank you, Jemima. Let me take some. Yofi, it's okay. Let me take some more questions so that uh, we get as many answers as possible. This one is from Obed. He's via Zoom. He wants to know whether the standards, Prof. This is to you. Whether the standards apply to IT service as well, and if they do, mm -hmm. could there be some explanations, please, especially mm -hmm. on the B two B and B two C fronts? Mm -hmm. Interesting question. Uh, thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. Vivian, the standards do apply to IT. In fact, now with IT security becoming on the top, um, your questioner may wish to know that we have an ISO standard 27001 that deals with IT information security, but there are several others. And indeed, one of the reasons why we had the banking challenges, one of the reasons was the lack of use of standardized IT infrastructure. So they do apply, and we are happy to discuss with the gentleman further, further points. Okay. Let me take two questions, one for you, Ali, and one for you, um, Auntie Jemima. This one says, hi, Vivian. Um, he wants to know uh, w what's the registration requirement for an NGO. And to you, Ali, uh, he wants you to clarify the income withholding mm -hmm. and that of the VAT withholding, mm -hmm. especially the area of withholding the 7% from the 12.5%. Mm -hmm. So let me let uh, Auntie Jemima start on the registration requirement for NGOs. So, so an NGO, first of all, has to be a company limited by guarantee. We do not give the NGO status. That is given by the Ministry of Social Welfare. And uh, you would, it's just like another company, except that in this case, its purpose should be non-profit. And so I'm talking of clubs, associations, churches, 
any organization that's purpose is non-profit can be a company limited by guarantee. So same thing, you need a minimum of two directors. You can download the forms from our website. You can get uh, everything you need from the website. That's the form 3A. Once you get, you can, then you have subscribers instead of shareholders. And so the com companies, uh, the shareholders or the subscribers guarantee that should in case the company is going under, they'll pay a minimum amount. Normally they'll say maybe 7 million or 5 million. It's not too much. But the key thing is, it's not like a company with shareholders that uh, you get dividend at the end of the year. This one, you should not be making any profit at all from the company. Should in case the company is going under, this company limited by guarantee has to transfer the assets to another company of similar objects. So once they have the documents from us, you get a constitution, you get a certificate of incorporation. It costs 270 to register this kind of business. You have to go to the Ministry of Social Welfare, who will in turn give you forms to fill. You pay a minimum amount, and they will get you an NGO certificate. So please note, not all companies limited by guarantee okay. end up being NGOs. You have to opt to be an NGO to go to the Ministry of Social Welfare. The rest remain as companies limited by guarantee, who, who also have to file annual returns at the end of the year with nil returns, because they are not supposed to be making profits. Okay. That's, that's, okay. All right, thank you. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, Ali, you answer the question. A lot for you, Grace, as well. For you, Yofi. For you, Prof. And for you, Jemima, as well. But we'll be right back with answers for your questions. Do stay with us. day to meet every challenge. It's a good day to want more out of life. It's a good day to wish for it, work for it, go get it. Familiar taste, a delicious indulgent with a flavor you just can't hide. Refreshing energy, gives so much for so little. For a strong performance, you've come to the right place. Good day energy drink. Why wait a minute to enjoy a good day when every second counts? Good Day Energy Drink keeps you going. Excessive drinking can be detrimental to your health. Not recommended for persons under 18 years, lactating mothers, pregnant women, and people sensitive to caffeine. This advertisement has been vetted and approved by the FDA. Welcome back um, to our forum for this year's City Business Festival. We are doing uh, this cast and doing business in Ghana. Uh, Focus is on the small, the medium, as well as the micro businesses. And we're taking your questions. Let me quickly go to some other questions. This one says, um, what are the standards? Um, you had one to answer, Prof. Um, Doc, so please go ahead with your answer. 
Yes, the distinction between the withholding yes. and then the income withholding and that for VAT. Mm -hmm. The seven and a half percent is a withholding tax on your income. Okay. So when you have issued an invoice for your fee, mm -hmm. the seven and a half percent is for the fee on your service. Mm -hmm. But the seven percent withholding is on the VAT component, the twelve and a half. Previously, you would have paid it to the service provider mm -hmm. to go and give to the revenue. Yeah. But now you are being asked to take 7% out of that and pay direct to the GRA. And then you give the difference of 55 to the service provider to go and file. So there are two different okay. amounts of withholding. Okay. Yeah. Let me take these uh, three there to um, Standards Authority Prof, to Jemima and to you, Ali, again. Um, he wants to know for Prof... The standards for a catering business and how do I begin to engage the GSA? Also, this one says, um, what types of business... Okay, I think I'll skip this one. Um, they want to know... I wanted to do a sole proprietorship, but I knew I would hire other people. Can I have a sole proprietorship and hire other people as well? This is to Madame Jemima. Also, another one for her. Can a company change from limited liability to partnership? And then, um, is there any tax relief for women-led agro-processing? So let's, uh, Auntie Jemima, start with her answers, and then we'll come to you. Um, yeah, thank oh. you very much. Um, sole proprietor can hire other people to work for them, except that the liability of the sole proprietor is unlimited and the business is tied to them. So if anything should happen to them, they die with the business. So for instance, a school that is a business name has a risk if the sole proprietor dies. All those people working with the sole proprietor, once that person dies, the name dies with the sole proprietor. Then we have problems of children coming to use the same name to run the school's account. So I would advise that schools and such you know, institutions that would have people working for them or relying on them for their, maybe their name, they should try their best to register either a partnership or a limited liability, which lives on long after the proprietor dies. That is it for so. So you can hire people, but I mean, just know that if you die, the business dies with you. And then we come to the limited liability changing to a partnership. That's not possible. Okay. You can move from a partnership to a limited liability company. But a limited liability company, do they have? We have different processes of liquidating it. Either you are liquidated. That is, we said dissolution without full winding up where you never commenced operations, you can be dissolved, or private part, private liquidation, where as shareholders, you realize that you, you are not doing well, but you can pay off all your debts and liabilities. You can appoint a private liquidator to, to put you off. Then the official liquidator comes in. That is where I'm also an official liquidator, where you are not able to pay your debts as it falls due. That one, too, we can officially liquidate you. So after we've done all that, then we can pick the name and possibly be a partnership. Okay. But with a partnership, you can transfer straight away from a partnership into a limited. So that's the difference. Okay. Prof, catering so, businesses, standardization. I mean, catering businesses currently are regulated by the Food and Drugs Authority and the local authorities. They can have what we call the Food Safety Management Systems or HACCP, H-A-C-C-P. And that basically ensures that the food and the processing of the food and the handling of the food is safe. So that is what I recommend for any catering business. Okay. This is to you, Grace. Um, they want to know, how do we access the funds mentioned by you? Good. So um, walk to any branch of ours, um, talk to us. You can also hit us on our, on our website and have access to our services. Uh, you would have to start a banking relationship with us. What does that mean? opening a bank account and um, start trading on your accounts with us. One of the things that we actively encourage is that as much as possible, formalize your business. You know, from beyond registering it, begin to run, operate a bank account. Let, let your bank be your, your, your cash book or your bookkeeper. That's a nice way for you to start building records. Because as you do that, then you begin to demonstrate a track record a growth and we can look at that and on the basis of that give you the funding that you need 
Okay, still to you. Uh, this one says it's too difficult to access loans for SMEs. Um, they, they want to know how they can go around that and how can they apply for collateral free loans as SMEs? Good. Um, yeah, the times are tough. I mean, and you did mention, especially during COVID, it's been extremely challenging. But the good news is that there's still a lot of opportunity. You know, so like I mentioned earlier, once you start the banking relationship and we are able to see your track record, you also uh, make sure that you're banking all your flows, all your proceeds. And thankfully, today, there are so many avenues through which you can bank, even if you're receiving sales through your wallet at the end of the day or in the course of the day, intermittently, you can transfer into your bank account so that the records are actually showing. You can receive payments online. You can receive payments via other digital means like the QR code. We are able to provide all those services to support you receive your sales proceeds um, into your bank account for it to reflect. Beyond that as well, as you build the track record based on the need you have or the plan mm -hmm. or the vision for expansion or growth that you have, we can actually support you and we can give you, maybe you don't need up to 500,000, mm -hmm. maybe you need just 50,000 or 100,000 okay. to do one or two things. We are able to provide that for you. And I'll just mention because there was a lady who asked something about taxes, but yeah. we also have a solution for women called Emerge. One of the things we've seen is that women entrepreneurs have a lot of potential and want to support them to emerge from obscurity into the limelight. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have a whole holistic solution that speaks to banking needs, speaks to capacity building, but speaks to also special she needs, okay. you know, all the way to children, because we have a lot of young women who are entrepreneurs who, when kids are on vacation, it's a challenge. We've got things like boot camps in partnership with some of these innovation hubs where your kids can learn coding and all that. So we're looking at a holistic solution for the entrepreneur across all genders. Okay. This one is going around as well. This next set, Hello Vivian, are there tax reliefs for companies situated outside the major cities? That is Accra and Tema. So I leave prepare for that. This one says, what is the cost and process for registering an intellectual patent in Ghana? Should the patent be under an individual name or a corporate name? Also, is there a tax imposed on these patents? And if yes, what is the calculation? And then this one says, um, I use the hash 222, no, the star 222 hash to renew my business name. How do I get a receipt since mm -hmm. the bank asked for proof of renewal before dealing with me? Opening account for the for opening account. How are they integrating all these processes? And then let me take the final one. Then we can have the answers. Should a large company that subcontracts withholding tax, when should a large company that subcontracts withholding tax when paying, even though the receiving company pays tax? So, Does that make yeah. sense? Okay. Yeah. So uh, let, let's go around. Okay. Um, Ali, you start then. Yes, the lady who asked about the. Um, agro processing yes there is uh, the concessionary rate of one percent you pay for the first five years mm -hmm. but if she's less than 35 then she qualifies as a young entrepreneur and can get five years tax holiday not paying taxes okay. and then uh, if you come to the withholding tax yes if a, a company is paying to the subsidiary there should be withholding you only be exempted from withholding the tax if the recipient can show exemption from withholding tax from the commissioner general because if you are in the good books you can apply and get the exemption from withholding tax okay. then you can get full value for all your invoices then there was an issue about um, location the incentives location, yeah, yes there are that, yes there are location yeah. incentives because companies in Accra Tema pay 25 uh, percent corporate tax rate but if you are in any regional capitals other than Accra Tema you have a 25 percent rebate so you pay 18.75 percent mm. and if you are in any other area other than regional capitals you have 50 percent rebate okay. so you'll be paying 12 and a half percent that's if you are in manufacturing okay but we don't stress that somebody will go and set a trading business and say <laughs> Uh, city and said it's at uh, 12 and a half percent so i think that's for manufacturing is located in other areas okay yeah. i think there were two to uh, jemima and prof i i think they were both to jemima okay. but I'm, I'm i'm happy to keep in mind the only point i was to add for okay. this was Vivian, when you mentioned the fact that is there a portal for all government businesses yes 
in terms of the laws and regulations. There is one. Okay. It's on B for B for um, Bravo, C for Charlie, P for Papa, bcp.gov.gh, and okay. you have all the laws, the regulations. It's all part of the business regulatory reforms by the Ministry of Trade and Industry, and it's free to everybody. bcp.gov.gh. Thank you, Prof, for that intervention. Jibawa, you can answer your questions. Yes, um, there's one thing that some people always make a mistake of. Um, a patent is completely different from a trademark. Okay. You know, uh, people, yeah, people can say, I want to even patent my food and, you know, things like that. But what they really want to do is maybe to do trademark their logo over the food that maybe they've been able to come out with. So please, for patent, it's for an individual, it's 100 Ghana CDs. And for organization, it's 300. A patent is a technical solution to a technical problem. It has to do with an invention. And it's different from a trademark, which is possibly a logo or a name identifying a product. So for trademarks, to do a search for just the name of the trademark is $110. And then to apply to get a trademark is $200. And then for the registration of the mark itself is another $200. So that comes to about $510. But for the patents, it takes a longer period. In fact, most people are not patenting. We have uh, foreigners coming to register patents more than Ghanaians. I'm praying that with the drive now, with the entrepreneurship drive and the value addition being added to things, people will now come up with more inventions, which would be a patent. And then we can get individuals 100 Ghana cities, organizations 300 Ghana cities. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that um, intervention. Um, this is to you. Um, I think we've answered. Ali Nacha, you didn't answer the question on the tax relief for women led agro processing. Yeah, I did because I said the agro processing, it's five years concessionary tax at 1% okay. for the first five years. And if she's below 35, she will qualify as a young entrepreneur and can get five years tax holiday without paying tax. Okay. It doesn't, it doesn't specify the well, gender. Uh, gen is, it's the okay. activity it's that qualifies. Bias. The gender does not assist her. Okay. This uh, next line is for um, uh, Jemima again. Uh, what does it mean to have a status Y for registration renewal? Also, please make the language of the hash, the star 222 hash, ussd menu simple for a layman's consumption uh, we didn't find it easy ascertaining where to go or which option applied to me lastly do i have to file returns as a registered sole proprietorship please explain the filing of returns a bit further and then this lady wants uh, madame jemima to go through the process of online registration of business uh, one more time Yeah. Can you please go over the question? So what does it mean to have a what? A, 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 a status Y for registration renewal. A status Y. Why? The alphabet Y. Y for York. Y for York. Or youth. And then what also they on our website. I don't know. Okay. Th then we'll move with that. And then also this it says hash the star two 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 hash USSD menu is <laughs> not simple for a layman's consumption. And um when they use it they can't ascertain where to go or which option is applied to them. And also they want you to go through the filing of returns again. Okay. We can just use any Android phone and go to and just key in star 222 hash. You're going to get four options. You have government payments. You get invoices, pending bills, GRA, RGD. RGD is four. So just like how you do a normal payment, you press four. When you press four, it will ask for your business name registration number. And straight away, it takes you into the portal for you to pay 25 Ghana cities with Momo or whatever means of money payment you want to use. And that's it. Then your status will change on my uh, system from not in good standing to good standing. So it's very simple, Vivian. It's very, very simple. Okay. They should track that. Okay. And when we say 
filing of annual returns, that refers to companies and partnerships. Where I said there's, look, okay, the annual return is a booklet. It's a booklet you can download from our website where it will, it will ask for the name of the company, the objects, if, if you've changed the objects, it will want the most updated objects. It will ask for who your directors are, the most updated information of your directors, your shareholders, your auditors. So everything that you initially started with, you have to give us that information in an updated way. The business name doesn't need to file annual returns. They only renew. That's why I said just use the star 222 hash. You renew with 25 Ghana cities and you are in good standing. I hope I've explained it. Okay. This one says, um, I just used the RGD code to renew my business. That was simple in the comfort of my office. But most of the time, banks and other institutions want to see the invoice after paying at the RGD. With this e-payment, I hope it won't be a problem. Also, my question to Ali Nacha, he said retailers don't have any incentive, but after supplying agreed goods to some companies, they withhold tax, and all your margin goes into that. What's the advice to retailers who face that problem? Should we calculate the 3% on the value of the goods before? before we sell okay um, with the with the retail sector once it's eating into your margin you have good grounds to apply for exemption from withholding tax when you make that application the commissioner general will always consider and grant you we have the same problem with like the oil marketing companies downstream they have very little margins and if you take the withholding everything is gone so okay. Yes, you can make the application and state your case. Also, one of the grounds under which you cannot withhold given to you by the law is that where the goods constitute stock in trade mm. for both parties, then you are not required to withhold. Okay. So either you, you are in the same line of business and so is stock in trade, don't withhold. If you are not, then apply to the Commissioner General for exemption from withholding tax. And arguing on the basis of your margins, I'm sure you can get a fair hearing. Okay. I think there was one for uh, Madame Jemaim. After that, we'll take the audio from our Zoom um, um, participants. So, Madame Jemaim, if you can answer your question, then we'll take the rest of the questions from our Zoom participants. I'm glad to hear somebody's used it, and it was very easy. Um, you were going to get an invoice sent to your mail, and that will be the evidence that you renewed your business. And you can show that to the banks, and that should suffice. Okay, so let's let's revert to our Zoom um, audience. If you have a question, you can raise your hand. We'll pick that question, and then um, we'll let the panel members. Uh, Frederick Do, do your hands are up, and you can shoot. Frederick, if you can hear us, you can go ahead with your question. Okay, so whilst we are waiting for Frederick, we can take others. Um, if you have Andrew, you can go ahead with your question. Okay, hello. Yes, Andrew, we can hello. hear you. Yes, hello. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Please, I wanted to ask if there are measures put in place to tackle the issue of double taxation. Okay. okay. Hello. Yes, Andrew, that's the measures in place put uh, measures put in place to tackle double taxation. The issue of Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew. So we can take two more so we can uh, address them. Thank you, Andrew. Cyril, please go ahead with your question. Thank you very much, Vivian. Uh, I would want to know from your um, from your panel um, who the regulators of private equity in Ghana are, and if one is to set up a if one is to set up a private equity campaign in Ghana. And who are the authorities to speak to? It's not very clear the people to approach, whether it's SEC, Bank of Ghana, or who. So if, if they could please throw more light. And also to Yofi, uh, if one is to set up a private equity in Ghana, what are some of the incentives that the company stands to get? Should they register with the GIPC? Thank you. Okay. Let me take Preva, then I'll let you guys answer the questions. Preva, please go ahead with your question. Farah, please go ahead. Um, okay. I want to from the 
that um, why do I need to pay a huge amount of money? I want to find out why I need to pay a huge amount of money to be registered to collect uh, uh, VAT for the um, government. Okay, so um, I think those are the four questions. Um, private equity, who regulates it? Double taxation and then private equity to UUV. So we can start with Prabhat's question. Mm. Yes, uh, private equity, certainly the regulator is the Securities and Exchange Commission um, because um, that, that's another window of financing that is non-bank. Mm. So I, I, I suspect that uh, exclusively to be the Securities sure. and Exchange Commission. Uh, now, on the registration of uh, private equity business in Ghana, um, it's a business. Uh, we should separate the, it being a business from what it does on the point of registration. So when you register a business, you go through a certain registration. And when you come to GIPC, it's the same. Um, and, and so you go through what it requires to do that. Um, you didn't specify whether it's a wholly owned local institution or it's partly foreign owned um, Institution because that would differ, um, and but if it's private equity and you are bringing in um, capital and it's a partnership, then of course um, you you would have the two hundred thousand um, requirement there. Now, what are the incentives that will give to you? Now, if your company um, goes above the fifteen million dollar um, limit, then you can apply for certain incentives. Now, we may give them to you, but the final authority on whether you have it or not lies with um, the Ministry of Finance um, as to what the business you're going to do. Um, and, and so I, I think that's what I, I, I have at the top of my head. I am not sure there are any special incentives to give to private equity or financing companies. Okay. Mm -hmm. Double taxation. Yes. Uh, double taxation refers to a situation where the same income is subject to tax in the hands of the same person, so twice. Uh, in, in Ghana, we have now moved to what we call worldwide income basis. So once you're a resident person for tax purposes, you are liable to pay tax on all income from all sources. Because of that, there is that automatic grant of a tax credit relief. So if you earn income from outside Ghana and you've paid tax on it, you are required to produce the evidence of the payment of the tax. The income would be added to your income in Ghana and the tax calculated and you'll be given a credit for the tax that you have paid. For some countries, we have double taxation treaties with. There will be different rules of application in the double taxation treaty. So we currently have with almost 10 to 11 countries. So that is what you need to look out for. Then Prepa was wondering why she has to register to collect VAT for government. Indeed, once it's government money, there's the need to identify you and then be able to track you for compliance purposes. Because the money, as I indicated, VAT is a charge that you are imposing and giving to government. It's, it's not your fee. So if you have your fee or your price of a thousand, government says charge VAT if you are a small scale retailer and you are on the flat rate 3% and bring it to me. So the person has paid you 1,000 plus the three. So mm -hmm. just remit it to government. Otherwise, the issue is that you will then be making money that belongs to government, and it has its consequences. Thank okay. you. All right, so I'm going to pick final comments from all of you. Our time's up. So um, 30 seconds mm -hmm. for everybody. <laughs> uh, since Ali, you spoke. Let me speak to, uh, go yes. to Professor Dodo. He's been so kind. And Jemima Owari, they've been so kind to us, patient and waiting. So, Prof, your final comments on the whole standardization arena. And then, Auntie Jemima, you can follow after that. I think my comments are that standards if you know the word is big, are simple things which are critical for every business. You need standards for your products, you need standards for your processes, and you need standards for your services. Remember, standards are the language for trade, and with good standards, you can assure good quality and link onto the big markets out there. So talk to us, and we'll support you. All Thank right. you. Thank you, Prof. Jemima? Yes, I just want to use this opportunity to inform my numerous customers that we have digitized most of our records or our processes now uh, for ease of doing business. Uh, for instance, when you come into our office, if you want to walk in, 
we have organizations like GRA linked with our system to get their tax number. We have NIA now also. Very soon, we're going to update our system to take, take NIA on board. We have a metropolitan municipal assemblies through the digital address. So now you get your business operating permit from our office when you complete registration. Okay. We give the data we generate to SNIT. So when we are talking about one-stop shop, RGD, we start off businesses, should be able to give that kind of service. GIPC will link them up through an API later on so that you'll be able to get information also about GIPC. And uh, we, I just want to quickly give you information about how to log on to the portal. You need to create a portal account with a valid email or a TIN. You get um, a unique password sent to your email, log on with that, and you get all the six types of business registrations on the portal. So you can register online. And once you complete it, our certificates now has a digital signature on it. You can get your profile and everything from the portal. You don't need to walk through the sun and come to the office. You can get these services online. So that is my message out there. And make sure after you've registered, you file your annual returns, your financial statements, and you renew your business, if it's a business name, to risk being stricken off the register. Thank you. Thank you, Jemima Wari. Grace. Thank you. And um, this has been a very insightful session. I think what I'd like to share with all our viewers across the world is um, that, yes, we have been through a crisis. Yes, um, it's time to get up and move ahead. But there's a lot of opportunity, you know. And so organizing yourself as an MSME. And if that's a challenge for you, talk to us. You know, as bankers, we are a means to an end. No bank is an end in itself. You know, we help you achieve your dreams. And in this specific case, the financial objectives that you have. And so we're here to support. The whole sector is here to support, and particularly for APSA as well. We're here to support the micro, small, and medium enterprise sector to grow. It is the engine of growth. Mm -hmm. It's tough out there, but it's possible to make it work. So we're here to support you in all your transactions, in all the payments, in all your receivables, in all your funding needs, in all your collaborations and ca capacity building for your company and even for your employees. So let's work together and, and make business good again in Ghana. All right. Thank Ali. you. Yes, I, I would say that for MSMEs, one of the best way to avoid unnecessary taxes is compliance. Just know what is expected of you and comply. And also take advantage of the incentives that came in the budget. Uh, for some of them, they don't have to pay those on the tax stamp. They are not to pay for the second, third, and fourth quarters. Mm -hmm. Those in the hospitality sector, they have 30% rebate on their taxes. Mm -hmm. And then also for those who have penalties and interest on outstanding taxes, up mm -hmm. to and including December last year, you have the opportunity up to September to apply for relief okay. and pay the first quarter and you get the relief. Okay, thank you. Doc, Yofi, your final word. Well, thank you very much for the platform. Um, at GIPC, I keep saying that we aim to please and ask is to ensure that we bring value to the Ghana economy. And I, I will add my voice to what many of, them have, many of my panelists have said, that partnerships are important. And when capital becomes difficult, partnership becomes another way of getting capital. You can partner with somebody in your procurement chain or your supply chain to build bigger and stronger. The opportunities do exist. And it's the same opportunities that foreign investors look at. And so our people should look at it. And I would like to say that um, a GIPC, um, to provide better quality services, we've set up an aftercare unit as well as uh, we're setting up a, a diaspora investment desk to help our brothers and sisters outside who constitute a major investor in our economy. Okay. But um, I, I dare say that the opportunities are there and if you require any further help, don't hesitate at all, whether you're a small company or a large company, to come speak to us 
If we can give you the help, we'll show you where the help is. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you so much. Yofi Grant is the CEO of GITC. Grace Enimia Boash is the Director of Business Banking at APSA. Dr. Abdelandi Ali Nachia is a Senior Lecturer at University of Ghana Law School. Via Zoom, we had Jemima Wari, Registrar General. Via Zoom, again, we had Professor Alex Dodo. And to you, the many participants via Zoom, thank you so much. And our viewers, thank you so much. My name is Vivian Kai Loko. The City Business Festival activities continues tomorrow on The Breakfast Show with Bernard Ablet. Thanks for your company. Goodbye.